Ellen White and Interpretation. This is a poem that was published in the Review and Herald some years ago, and it captures how Adventists have misused Ellen White. It's called Sister White Said It. Sister White said it, well, I never really read it, but someone said she said it, so of course it must be so. To prove my point, I'll quote it, though I can't show where she wrote it, but someone said she said it, and that's all I need to know. It saves a lot of time for me if I just listen carefully when others speak of Sister White and what they say she said. Though I can't repeat it word for word, I'll tell you what I think I heard and quote you things from Sister White that no one's ever heard. Now that poem is somewhat humorous, but it does capture the way we tend to misuse these writings. And it leads us into the issue of correct interpretations. If someone says, Ellen White said it, you always want to ask, what's the date of that statement? What was going on in the church at the time? What issues was she addressing? And what is the literary context of that statement? What are the paragraphs surrounding it? That's what is usually left out. So let's look at this. The need for correct interpretation. Any sacred text, such as the Bible written years ago, require that some basic rules be used in order to understand what was written. Time, culture, geography, and language create barriers that sometime, typo there, excuse me, sometimes make it difficult to understand what someone wrote. What is hermeneutics? That's a big term. Hermeneutics actually is a term used in the Greek New Testament. Hermeneia. It's used several times. It means to interpret, to translate. When Jesus was walking with the disciples in the walk to Emmaus, and explain to us these things, translate them for us. The, the root of hermeneo was used there. So that's where we derive our English word hermeneutics, which simply means principles of interpretation, or as formally defined here, hermeneutics is the science and methodology of interpretation. What does the prophet mean by what the prophet says? What the words mean and do not mean? Ellen White experienced misinterpretation of her writings in her own day. She spoke of it frequently. It was a constant frustration for her. Listen to her comments here. Many men take the testimonies the Lord has given, picking out a sentence here and there, taking it from its proper connection. And the term connection is the same thing that we mean today by our word context. And applying it according to their idea. Thus poor souls become bewildered when they could read and order all that has been given they would see the true application and would not become confused. Much that purports to be a message from Sister White serves only the purpose of misrepresenting Sister White. So this is something that she dealt with during her lifetime. It's not just a phenomenon that occurs today. Again, in a letter on June 29, 1906, those who are not walking in the light of the message may gather up statements from my writings that happen to please them. And that agree with their human judgment and by separating these statements from their connection or context and placing them beside human reasoning make it appear that my writings uphold that which they condemn. I charge you not to do this work. To use my writings thus is misleading and inconsistent. So interpretation was very important to Ellen White. Again, she wrote, it seems impossible for me to be understood by those who have had the light but have not walked in it. What I might say in private conversations would be so repeated as to make it mean exactly opposite to what it would have meant had the hearers been sanctified in mind and spirit. I'm afraid to speak even to my friends for afterward I hear, and this is my bold, Sister White said this and Sister White said that. It's interesting, in later life, because the way people would take things she said out of context, she refused to interview people one-on-one -on -one toward the end of her life because they'd so often abused what she'd said, taken sentences and given their own twist on it. She didn't talk with anybody in personal counseling in later life like she did in earlier, year, earlier years. She was a people person. She liked to interact with people and help them, but because of this frustration, she didn't do it. 
My words are so rested and misinterpreted that I am coming to the conclusion that the Lord desires me to keep out of large assemblies and refuse private interviews. And that's what I just told you. That is what she did. Now, there are many cases of misinterpretation. Here are some areas that Ellen White is most often misinterpreted. Health reform. Do you know what she said about people who abuse her statements about health reform? She said she called that health deform. And there's a lot of that going on. A lot of people taking her statements to the extreme. The book Councils and Diets and Foods has some interesting and helpful information in it, but it does not give the context of those statements. But people read it as if the order that those statements are in is inspired. When it, when it was actually human beings that put it together there. And so they, if you do that, you can get into extremes on diet. I'll give you some examples of that later on. And of course, diet and dress, recreation and amusement. Statements are taken out of context there. You get the feeling that Ellen White doesn't want anybody to have any fun. But that's not the case. Educational theory and practice, religious experience and practice, racial issues, cultural issues, debt, homemaking. These are areas that she's most often misinterpreted. An excellent book that I recommend, and I just mentioned it at the outset of my remarks, one of the books in George Knight's series on Ellen White. There's Meeting Ellen White and the book I shared earlier, Walking with Ellen White, and then this one, Reading Ellen White. That is an excellent little book, about 120 pages. It deals with principles of interpretation. It's simply put, it's straightforward, it is extremely helpful. I tell pastors that every new convert to your church ought to be required to read this book. If new converts to Adventism read this book, it would inoculate them from all these extreme ideas about Ellen White people share with them. All these misinterpretations of Ellen White. And they would know how to read her from the very outset, or I should say know how to read her correctly, from the very outset of their Adventist experience. So I'm drawing from that book and other sources. Adventist scholars have thought a lot about interpretation and pulled it together. In my book, Ellen White Under Fire, I have two major chapters on interpretation. I get pretty deep there. But Knight makes it very simple and easy to understand. And I'm going to condense it into what I have called seven basic steps to interpreting Ellen White. Seven rules of interpretation. And I want to briefly unpack each one the rest of our time together. First of all, study all available information on a topic. And I will say more about these as I get to them. But you don't want to just read one part here and one part there on a subject. Read everything she has to say about it. Study each statement in its literary context and in its historical context. And those two are the most important. In fact, those two rules are where the critics totally miss the boat. They ignore the literary context and the historical context. And I will give you a more formal definition of what that means in a moment. Discover the underlying principles between the or uh, beneath the statements. Ellen White wrote in the 19th century. She uses 19th century imagery that's not that familiar to 21st century folk. And so we need to look at the principles behind it, just like in the Bible. Stay balanced, avoiding extreme interpretations. That's crucial. And remember that inspiration is not verbal dictation. Now that's a key one. And I'd be tempted to talk the whole hour about inspiration. That is an important topic. I'll just touch on it when we get to that. But you, if your inspiration of Ellen White is wrong, your whole approach to her will be wrong. And finally, maintain a healthy spiritual mindset. This is my seven rules for reading Ellen White in a healthy, holistic way and avoiding misinterpretations. First rule, study all available information on a topic. Now, it's important to note that she had nothing to say about these issues here. Cinema and videos and movies. The first movie came out in 1915 when Ellen White died. So, some people try to say she was talking about movies in this statement and that statement, but she was not. Television, radio, movies did not exist in her day. But, are there principles in her writings that we can apply to that today? Certainly there are. She never said anything about contraception, abortion. That's a big issue today. The Bible didn't say anything about abortion. But are there principles that we can apply to it? 
Certainly there are. The sanctity of life and so forth. Ellen White says the same. In cremation, organ transmit, euthanasia, many of the issues, stem cell research, issues that we're struggling with today. There are principles in inspired writings that apply to them, but we must not say she's talking for specifically about abortion in this statement. She couldn't. It wasn't an issue back then. She can't be talking about television. It didn't exist in her day. That's common sense. On other topics, she had only a few things to say. She said very little about life insurance, so we can't make any broad claims about whether or not you should have life insurance based on Ellen White's statements. And she talked about two special resurrections. She only said very little about them. And another issue I don't have up here, she didn't say much about the 144,000. But I've heard Adventists who base their whole doctrine of Adventism on the 144,000. And so we need to be careful about that and not read something in Ellen White that's not there. So it's important to understand the issues that she talked about, the difference between issues that she talked about and issues that she did not. Now there's some excellent tools for interpreting Ellen White, for seeing the big picture of her writings. Now many of you may have the old classic three volume index, comprehensive index. That's a hard copy. That's all been replaced now of course with the internet, with the CD-ROM. You can get the, the complete published writings of Ellen White on CD-ROM and that's the next point here. There are, for under twenty dollars you can get all the early review and heralds, all kinds of study resources and research materials and writings of the pioneers along with the complete published writings of Ellen White they're all on the CD-ROM for under twenty dollars you can load it onto your computer I have it on my laptop I take it with me everywhere you all should also should know that with our iPhones and iPads and iTouches and all of this there is an app now that the White Estate has put out it's a free app you can get all of Ellen White's published writings on your iPad or your iPhone you can download that app we're all into apps now and it's amazing what you can do with that. So you, you can access those writings that way through all of our technology today. But when you want to do research, the CD-ROM is the best. Also, the Ellen G. White Estate website, you can access all of her published writings there. But the CD-ROM, I have found, is faster. So you're looking for a topic, you just type in the Holy Spirit. And it will give you every hit of everything she ever said about the Holy Spirit. You can click on the link and it'll take you right there. And those of you who have used computer technology, you know what I'm talking about. You have it all right there. The key, though, is to not just read the few sentences she says about the subject. Read the bigger picture. You know, we talk a lot about compilations, compilations of Ellen writings. Whenever I speak on this subject, I'm always asked about that. And my response is that many of the compilations cause complications. Because they, as I mentioned before about councils and diets and foods, they don't give the literary context. And many of the early compilations, the later ones are better, but the early compilations were often done by a single individual. And they tend to reflect the bias of that single individual. Message to Young People is a classic one. Message to Young People has a lot of great statements in it. When I first became an Adventist, I read that book and it, it helped me. But it's, others have been frustrated with it or found that it, they weren't balanced by reading it. And the fact is there are very few of Ellen White's beautiful grace statements and messages to young people. It's hard hitting about sanctification. What's interesting, you, we have found that the individual who put that compilation together had a sin problem. And that person pulled all the statements that spoke to his problem. And so it's very biased in his direction. That's why he pulled all these hard-hitting sanctification statements. And so it reflects his own problem, see? So that it's not a well-balanced compilation. It can cause complications for young people. They, and we've discussed updating it with some more grace oriented statements to balance it out. It has some good statements, but they need to be balanced out with the bigger picture of how Ellen White speaks on the whole salvation experience. But that book reflects the bias of the compiler. Same with other books. The later compilations are better regarding that, but even then, 
they don't give you the full context. You, ha you can read the compilations, but make sure you think, okay, that's a nice statement, but what's going on before and after that statement? So the CD-ROM is best used with that in mind. And then there's a forthcoming CD-ROM of the unpublished materials of Ellen White. This is a long time coming. Actually, it's already on uh, CD-ROM, all of her unpublished writings, but only White Estate personnel has access to them. I can have access to it if I go to the White Estate, but they won't let me take it home. I've gotten on my knees and begged, but they're pretty careful with that. In fact, I'll, uh, some of you probably have a question about a legal issue that's happened recently. Uh, before I get into that, let me tell you that the White Estate has been working on a long-term project to publish all of these unpublished letters. The issue is, if they just set those letters out there, there's a lot of material that needs explaining in her personal letters. And it's, people could exploit these statements without the context. So they have an annotator, is what they call it, who goes through and puts footnotes to every place, event, person that Ellen White is talking about so you understand the context. And volume one is finished. It should be released later this year, the first of next year. It's all of her unpublished letters from 1845 to 1859. I had the privilege of being on the committee and working with it. And that will be released pretty soon. And they're planning on doing that over the years. It'll take probably a decade to get them all out because it, it takes a lot of work to go through that and send it out to all the readers and reviewers and so forth. But here's what happened. Some person came to the White Estate, convinced them that they were going to do honest research. But this person, while the White Estate personnel was not watching, downloaded a lot of the unpublished material took it out and published it on a website. So all those private letters that the White Estate was not going to release without explanation in the years to come have been published. And so, rightly so, the White Estate has launched a lawsuit against this, person, this individual in their company because it was, not, it was unethical to do that. So some of you asked me about that. That's what's going on right now, litigation. Uh, against this individual for releasing these writings when they weren't supposed to. It, and again, it's not that the White Estate is hiding anything. It's just that those writings, those unpublished letters, need clarification, explanation before they're released. Because of that, I'm told just by speaking with the White Estate personnel recently, that they may end up just releasing all of them anyway in the next couple of years since this has already happened. But we'll have to see what happens with the litigations and all of that. But some of you had questions about that, so that addresses that issue. But eventually, I'm sure it will all be released on a CD-ROM. And I want to tell you, I, I, do co I, I long for all of us to read through Ellen White's unpublished letters. That's when you get a glimpse of the real Ellen White. And it's different than the Ellen White in her published writings. And it's fascinating. And she's consistent, but you see in her diary entries and her discussions with family members and when she wrote, writes about broken down wagons and trees and, and, and the garden struggle she was having and just how she related to that as a person. You see Ellen White the Christian, Ellen White the person, and I think that's a picture we all need. So I hope that uh, we can all have access to those writings in the near future. But these are tools that will help you see the big picture of what she says on any subject. So read her comprehensively. Second rule, study each statement in its literary context. Now what is this phrase, literary context? The literary context is the paragraphs, pages, documents, and books surrounding the statement. As you've already heard me allude to this, what are the paragraphs before and after a statement? That's the context. What she says on the whole page or the chapter. Now, I like to illustrate this as what I call the circles of context, concentric circles. You start with the basic unit of thought in Ellen White's writings. That's a sentence, the English sentence. In the Greek or the Hebrew, particularly the Greek, you know, one Greek word in the New Testament can be translated into a full English sentence. So when I do this for interpreting the Bible, I say a word. But with Ellen White's writings, her basic unit of thought is the English sentence. So you st what's the context of that sentence? That sentence as we look at the concentric circles in the con is in the context of a paragraph. Well, that paragraph is in the context of a page. That page is in the context of a document, whether it's a pamphlet or a testimony or a letter. Or if it's a book, it would be the chapter in that book or in light of the whole book. So you want to look at it in the larger document or the larger book. 
And as I shared with you this morning, you want to look at it ultimately in light of the Conflict of the Age series. Remember I said that's the theological framework for interpreting Ellen White's writings? Some of these obscure statements should be interpreted in light of her very clear writing in the Conflict of the Age series. That's the theological framework for everything she had to write. That's why it's so important that we all are, first of all, familiar with the Conflict of the Age series and then read the rest of her writings in that light. That reflects Ellen White at her most mature level, the last two decades of her life. She was pulling everything together and articulating with maximum clarity the great controversy as the Lord had shown it to her and as she understood it. And so that is the framework for reading everything else. So that's the starting point and read these other statements in light of that. And then ultimately you want to read that sentence in light of everything she wrote. I remember as a pastor a person who was obsessed with a certain idea about Ellen White and he'd bring a book of Ellen White to me and say look what she says here and he pulled some idea an extreme idea out of that and I just observed instantly on the other page when you looked at the statement in the context it was saying the opposite of what he was saying it said and so you just look at the larger immediate context and it will bring great clarity she's clear enough that you, you, you can understand what she's saying. So you have the local literary context, which is the sentence, paragraph, page, document, and the wider literary context is, is the whole book, the Conflict of the Age series, and everything she wrote. Now let's look at some examples. Eggs. How many had eggs for breakfast this morning? Shame on you. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But she had some things to say about eggs. In a sermon in the Battle Creek Tabernacle on March 6, 1869, Ellen White raised the question of inconsistency in the practice of health reform in relationship to daily Christian living. She wrote in Testimonies 2, You place upon your table butter, eggs, and meat, and your children partake of them. And then you come to meeting and ask God to bless and save your children. How high do you think your prayers go? Wow. And then she said more specifically to this family, or to another family in 1869 she wrote a letter to a brother and sister E in a simple sentence she stated flatly eggs should not be placed upon your table why they are an injury to your children now some take that okay no eggs do you eat eggs you're sinning because the prophet said not to eat eggs how do we interpret this statement it raises, it raises the logical question, is your table to be understood in the singular, referring specifically and only to the table of brother and sister E, or does your table refer collectively to the tables of all Seventh-day Adventists? How do we determine that? We look at the larger context of the statement. In the larger framework of her writings, she said this about eggs. Testimonies, Volume 7, page 135. In some cases, the use of eggs is beneficial. Those who raised your hand that ate eggs this morning, you're okay. In some cases of persons whose blood-making organs are feeble, anemia, milk and eggs should not be wholly discarded. That's in Ministry of Healing of all places. So you find a balance in Ellen White's writings. Now I think the vegan craze today, a lot of Adventists are going vegan, a lot of other people are going vegan. New Agers are big on veganism. I think veganism is a great thing. But I think we need to be careful not to force that on everybody else. Ellen White would not do that. She was balanced about these things. Testimonies, Volume 9. While warnings have been given, yet we should not consider it a violation of principle to use eggs from hens that are well cared for and suitably fed. Eggs contain properties that are remedial agencies in counteracting certain poisons in the body. So you find a balance here. I should say that that particular family that she was writing to had a specific issue that she was addressing and eggs were problematic and that's what she was addressing. She was speaking to that family and that family alone when she said eggs should not be placed upon your table. One example of extremism happened in the life of Dr. Daniel Cress who became anemic from his abstinence of all animal products without a proper wholesome diet and replacement. In other words, he took Ellen White so literally that if Sister White said not to eat milk and eggs, he didn't touch them. The problem is he didn't know how to eat a balanced vegan diet, and so he developed anemia. And he was a physician, and he was struggling. 
and he came to her for counsel. You know what she told him? It may surprise you. She recommended that he change his eating habits and eat a raw egg in a glass of grape juice two or three times a day in order to receive the nourishment that he greatly needed. And after a few days, his strength came back, and he said he continued that for the rest of his life. And it really helped him. Now, do you think we should eat a raw egg and a glass of grape juice today? It would be extremely unwise. Even a raw egg bought at the grocery store, because we know it can carry salmonella, don't we? It, that wasn't a big issue back then. But nowadays, it's dangerous to do a raw egg. Anybody here want to eat a raw egg? I don't think so. I don't think I would. We have one brave soul. I'd rather eat raw tofu than a raw egg. Maybe. So you find a balance here. That's the point. Relevant for us today is the warning with its promise penned in 1901 where she declared that the time will come when we will need to discard from the diet all animal products. See, this is why veganism is not a bad idea. But when the time comes, God will reveal this. No, this is my bold, no extremes in health reform are to be advocated. Thank you, Ellen. Where has that statement been? Let's broadcast it. Because there are so many extreme ideas in health reform. I can still remember in the past some of these dear saints that are caught up into health deform. Beady eyes, really skinny, live on bamboo shoots and grass. I'm exaggerating. And I mean, they come up and they push this agenda on other people when that's not the best thing to do. Now again, there is a place for a very careful diet. But we need to be careful in how we relate to people. Pushing it to an extreme is what Ellen White called health deform. She was balanced about it. God will reveal this. No extremes in health reform are to be advocated. Are you saved? Now, this is a statement that is exploited by critics. It's taken out of its context. It reads like this. Those who accept the Savior, however sincere their conversion, should never be taught to say or to feel that they are saved. See, Ellen White militates against assurance of salvation. She doesn't believe that you can have that assurance. But I shared with you this morning, she found that assurance herself. And she preached assurance. What's going on here? A closer look at Ellen White's cautions here regarding the subject reveals that in context, she is not speaking against the certainty of a believer's present standing with God. She is warning against the presumptuous once saved always saved teaching of eternal security. Those who claim I am saved while continuing to transgress the law of God. Now, it would be fun to get into her, her theological tradition that she drew from. I'm tempted to do that and I don't want to go because it'll I'll get carried away and it's really interesting, but she came out of Methodism. She followed the teaching of John Wesley. John Wesley followed the teach of, teaching of Jacob Arminius. Jacob Arminius was a contemporary of John Calvin. John Calvin taught the predestination, and Calvin's followers are predestination friends and Baptists derived once saved, always saved from that. But Arminius said, wait a minute, no, there is a freedom here of choice. God is not preordained who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. He leaves the choice with us. And that tradition continued. In fact, if you look in church history over the last several hundred years, it's been the Arminians against the Calvinists debating back and forth. Adventists stand clearly in the Arminian tradition. John Wesley pulled the best of the Calvinist and the Arminian theology together. And, to, and Wesley clearly taught that while we can have assurance of salvation, you can choose to walk out of Christ. And you can be lost. Ellen White came out of that tradition. So she clearly reflects that. So saying that you can, after you're saved, you can walk out of salvation, you can still have assurance of salvation. That's the her theological tradition. Remember, God didn't give her everything from the sky. God used her background, her education, her experience, her upbringing. And he used all of that in teaching her truth. And so that's the background for this statement, that theological tradition. We would call it Wesleyan Arminianism. That's our theological tradition as Seventh-day Adventists. Now here's the context of that statement, the immediate context. 
Peter's fall was not instantaneous, but gradual. Self-confidence led him to the belief that he was saved, and step after step was taken in the downward path until he could deny his master. Never can we safely put confidence in self or feel this side of heaven that we are secure against temptation. Those who accept the Savior, however sincere their conversion, should never be taught to say or to feel that they are saved. This is misleading. You see the context of that statement? Now let's look at the large, that's the immediate literary context. Now let's look at the larger literary context. She said, everyone should be taught to cherish hope and faith, but even when we give ourselves to Christ and know He accepts us, we are not beyond the reach of temptation. Elsewhere, she said this. Listen to this statement of confidence in salvation. Each of you may know for yourself that you have a living Savior, that He is your helper and your God. You need not stand where you say, I do not know whether I am saved. Do you believe in Christ as your personal Savior? If you do, then rejoice. Amen? i got to wake you up here. I see you sleeping. It's that potluck. But if I were in your place, I'd probably be doing the same thing. Salvation was important for Ellen White. This is a great statement here. This is a personal letter she was writing to a woman who was struggling with her assurance of salvation. The message from God to me for you is, Him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. Notice how she applies this text. If you have nothing else to plead before God but this one promise from your Lord and Savior, you have the assurance that you will never, never be turned away. It may seem to you that you are hanging upon a single promise, but appropriate that promise, and it will open to you the whole treasure house of the riches of the grace of Christ. Cling to that promise, and you are safe. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Listen to this last sentence. Present this assurance to Jesus, and you are as safe as though inside the city of God. If that's not assurance, I don't know what is. That's the larger framework of her statement. Never say that you were saved. That's a specific context addressing once saved, always saved, false confidence. The Christian can have assurance. The third rule, so that's the literary context. Now the historical context. Study each statement in its historical context. The historical context is the time, place, and circumstances in which the message was originally given. She provided a general principle here in regard to her own writings. In 1911, she said regarding the testimonies, and that's what we have in the nine volumes of the testimonies, which covers many, many years of time. You know, something she wrote in 1860 has a completely different context than something she wrote in 1880. Time changed. So she said, nothing is ignored, nothing is cast aside, but time and place must be considered. So this is so crucial. Now let me share with you in addition to understanding Adventist history, we Adventists need to understand more American history in the 19th century. Our Adventist pioneers and Ellen White were a product of 19th century America. And let me summarize that history in a nutshell. But I would recommend that you get good histories of America and read through that because that will throw all kinds of light on our pioneers and what they went through. But in a nutshell, the 19th century can be summarized by the great dividing line right down the middle of it. There was a traumatic event that divided 19th century America right down the middle. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Civil War. The, yeah. The, the Civil War, 1861 to 1865. And do you know we are right now in the 150 year anniversary of the Civil War. And during that time, our church was birthed. We chose the name in 1860 on the eve of the Civil War, the name Seventh-day Adventist, and we established a general conference in 1863. In fact, we established a general conference just a couple of weeks before the most famous battle of the Civil War was fought, Gettysburg. So you find this interesting connection, but the Civil War divided America, American history. In fact, historians call the period before the Civil War antebellum America. Antebellum is a Latin term that means before the war. America before the Civil War is termed America before the war. Several factors because of that. There were a series of events that 
would eventually lead into the Civil War. Political events that would lead into the Civil War was all surrounding the issue of slavery. And the culture of that period, the theological culture was interesting and different. They, the, all the preachers were post-millennialist. They believed that there would be no imminent second coming of Christ that it, that they, and that humanity would perfect themselves and usher in the millennium. That was the theological idea in which Adventism was born. That's why Millerism was so different from it. And Ellen White's early prophetic ministry, a number of things she wrote were influenced by the issue of slavery because the issue of slavery was coming to a head. And when you understand that background, what was taking place, especially when slavery was really coming to a head in 1850, uh, between 1850 and 1861, she is addressing those issues. And then in the years 1861 to 65, you're, you're dealing with the Civil War. And so statements that she makes reflect that issue. In fact, my next book that I'm writing right now is going to be on Ellen White and the Civil War. She made some fascinating statements and predictions about the Civil War, and I'm going to set those statements in, th in their historical context of the Civil War. I'm just having a great time immersing myself in Civil War literature. I've never studied it to this depth, and I mean, I have all these volumes, and, and I mean, I'm just having a good time. The Civil War is more fascinating than I ever dreamed, and I'm on sabbatical next January for the year, and uh, that's when I'm going to really get into the writing. I'm going to just be immersed in the Civil War. Anyway, I'm... Uh, getting distracted there. The period after the Civil War, that is called the Reconstruction period in American history. Think about it. Our nation was devastated. The South was fragmented, so they had to reconstruct the Union. And that took place the first 15 years after the Civil War. I mentioned this morning that, you know, a Northerner could not travel into the South until the 1890s. So all of that is a part of the historical context that our pioneers lived in. And when you understand that basic historical background, it sheds all kinds of light on Ellen White's statements, her life, and the development of our church. And history, when you see it in that light, it becomes very interesting. Now let's look at a statement that must be understood according to its historical setting. In 1894, Ellen White said some strong things about the bicycle. How many here ride a bicycle? I do. I have a nice road bike. I ride it about an hour a day to get exercise when the weather is permitting or when my class schedule permits me. But listen to what she said about a bicycle. There seemed to be a bicycle craze. Money was spent to gratify an enthusiasm. A bewitching influence seemed to be passing as a wave over our people there. Satan works with intensity of purpose to induce our people to invest their time and money in gratifying supposed wants. This is a oops, species of idolatry. Better get rid of those bikes. There were some who were striving for the mastery, each trying to excel the other in the swift running of their bicycles. Strong indictment of bicycles. Does that apply today to our bicycles? Some I've heard make that application, but this must be understood according to its historical setting. This was an interesting period at the turn of the century. Fortunately, there is a Reader Digest article that describes in a very helpful way what the issue was here. So understanding the context of, of the time when Ella White made this comment is crucial. The fad of buying sickles showed a, a poor stewardship of time and money, she said, and B, gave rise to competition, rivalry, and a strife for supremacy. And here's that article in the Reader's Digest describing the bicycle craze at the turn of the century. Toward the end of the last century, this was, of course, written in the 20th century, so the last century would be the 19th century. We're in the early 21st century now. Toward the end of the last century, the American people were swept with a consuming passion which left them with little time or money for anything else. What was this big new distraction? America had discovered the bicycle, and everybody was making the most of the new freedom it brought. The bicycle, be bicycle began as a rich man's toy. Society and celebrity went a wheel. The early or best early bicycle cost $150, an investment comparable to the cost of an automobile today. Every member of the family wanted a wheel, and entire family savings often were used up on supplying the demand. 
and Adventists were participating in this craze. So you, under, you look at that historical explanation, her statements make perfect sense. What is interesting, she never spoke against bicycles again after this time. Why? Because a few short years later, the price came down on bicycles. They stopped becoming a, you know, a symbol of your status. People used them for transportation. They started using them for exercise. Ellen White had no problem with that. So this is one example. It's a common example of how the historical context sheds tons of light on her statements and helps us understand them. What's the principle behind the statement? Use your money wisely. Don't try to keep up with the Joneses, whether it's clothing or vehicles. Buy things that you just, you really need and do it for the glory of God, not for the glory of self. That's the principle behind these statements. And I'm jumping ahead because we'll look at the principles in a moment. Here some, are some helpful tools for studying the historical context. George Knight's book, Ellen White's World. It's a short little book. I mentioned it earlier today. It provides the 19th century culture and it sheds light on many of Ellen White's statements. You think, oh, I don't have time or the interest to read a big history textbook on the 19th century. Here's a short 120 page book written in a very interesting and readable way that will shed all kinds of light on what life was like in 19th century America. George Knight's book, A Brief History of Seventh-day Adventist, is a concise little book that, that he does a good job summing up Adventist history. And that's why I said earlier, whenever someone quotes Ellen White, ask them what's the date of that statement. And you can come to this book and look at what was going on in the church then. If it's made in the 1860s, it may be related to the Civil War or organizational issues. If it's a statement made in the 1870s, it probably is relating to education because we were really struggling with our education and Battle Creek College was failing and Ellen White had a lot to say about that. When you get to the 1880s, it probably is related to the crisis regarding salvation. And so what's going on in the church? That's where these history books come in handy. And Knight's books are very readable histories. And then Arthur L. White's six-volume biography of Ellen White. Now that's where you get a comprehensive view of Ellen White uh, and, and her times. He gives you a lot of the background. And, and you can just look up. A, a, you find a date in a statement. You want to know what was going on? We'll go to this book and... He does it chronologically, look, look at the date and read what was happening in her life at the time. And it'll illuminate that passage historically. And then uh, Denis Fortin and Jerry Moon, my friends and colleagues at the seminary, also Michael Campbell is one of the editors as well. This Encyclopedia of Ellen White is forthcoming. It's been a long journey to get this thing published. I wrote articles for it literally years ago. It's, it's from Adventist scholars all across the denomination, issues about Ellen White. There's two volumes, a topical volume that deals with any topic related to Ellen White, and then a biographical volume which deals with any person related to Ellen White. This two-volume biography finally will be released probably uh, next spring. So that will be a priceless resource that every Adventist home will want to have. So be sure and get that when it comes out. That's where you can really get the historical background of what was going on and who was this person Ellen White mentioned and so forth. Very helpful tools. The fourth rule, discover the underlying principles. I've touched on this already, but let's look at it more directly. What is a principle? A definition of principle is an unerring, unchanging rule of human conduct or behavior. The characteristics of a principle are two. They can be universal, a principle applies to all men and women in all places, that's the horizontal aspect. Then there's the eternal aspect. A principle applies to all historical time periods and never changes. In other words, principles are timeless. That's the bottom line. And there are timeless principles in the Bible. Some critics of the Bible will, and Ellen White will say, well, that's time conditioned. That only applies to her day. Or that only applies to the first century in the Bible or Old Testament times. It has no application to us. No. When you look deep into it, it's an inspired text. There are principles that apply to us today. 
And so we want to understand what those principles are. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's a universal and eternal principle. Eternal and universal principles are applied to particular contextual situations through specific counsels. Applications of principles may change as the circumstances which call them forth change. Now, it's important to understand that there is a major difference between an application and a principle. The principle is eternal and never changes. Applications of the principle change. Let's look at an example. In 1903, Ellen White wrote this counsel to young women. Girls who could learn to harness and drive a horse would be better fitted to meet the emergencies of life. How many of you ladies were raised to know how to harness a horse? According to this, you're not prepared for daily life. That's late 19th century imagery going on there. But is there an application of this today? Is there a What's the principle here? What should we do with it, this council? In our modern society, is it imperative that our Seventh-day Adventist schools teach a girl how to harness and drive a horse? Of course not. When we look at the literary context, Ellen White is urging girls as well as boys to obtain a practical education. That's the principle. In order to be better fitted to meet life's emergency situations, the historical context are the rural communities of 1903. Applying that principle to today, what's the application to today? What do our young people need to be prepared for life today? Pardon me? I'm turning to teacher now. Say again. Take care of an automobile. Change its oil, or at least know when it needs a change of oil and go to the oil change place. Basic maintenance of a car. How about what was something in our 21st century they our children really have to have in our schools. What is it? Computer. The application changes. Computers had no application in the late 19th century. But they have application in the 21st century. But the principle is changeless. But the application changes. Here's another example, and I'm jumping ahead here. Ten minutes. Wow. I just get lost in this stuff, and time just goes on. So, um, one other example here, vegetarianism. Is vegetarianism a principle or is it an application? Which is it? The principle is healthful living. You eat and drink for health, whatever is the most healthy. Vegetarianism is an application of that. Vegetarianism is not an eternal moral principle. We sometimes make a moral issue out of vegetarianism. Ellen White never did that. In fact, if you've never heard this, I'm going to shock you. Ellen White had her health vision in 1860, and, or 61, and that's when she was a great meat eater up to that time, and that's when she discarded eating meat. And she describes that experience and how much better she felt when she quit eating meat. But here's the fact. For decades following that, she continued to eat meat. Critics have called her on this and said she's inconsistent. But when you look at the context, the historical context, she was a vegetarian in principle. Most of the time when she wasn't traveling, she was at home and she could obtain fresh fruits and vegetables and good food, she ate a vegetarian diet. But when she traveled in the 19th century, there were no bylaws. There was no vegetarian restaurants. There was none of that. It was hard to get fruits and vegetables. And she often stayed in the homes of poor Adventists who could not afford vegetables and fruits. And so she had to eat meat in their home. And in traveling, sometimes the only nourishment they could get was meat. So on rare occasions such as that in traveling, she ate meat. It's documented in her letters. But when she was able to eat a vegetarian diet, she did that. It was all the way up until 1894 that she made it clear in Australia she was through eating meat altogether. 
And that's when she discarded meat, and we know she never ate meat after that. Although here's another little interesting part of the history. She stopped eating meat, but she continued eating fish. They still didn't understand the difference. They thought fish were vegetarian. <laughs> then, they just, then she realized fish were not good, and she stopped eating fish. Now here's another shocker, and critics bring this up. She has several references in her letters telling family to be sure and bring some nice oysters home. Oysters are an unclean food. But at that point, Ellen White and the others didn't understand all the difference in the shellfish. It wasn't until the turn of the century that Stephen Haskell did a major study and concluded, they'd already concluded that pork was unclean, but they had not concluded that oyster was Oysters were unclean. So it wasn't until the turn of the century that they finally concluded that all the shellfish and oysters was unclean. And Ellen White never, she didn't have a vision on everything, so she had no vision telling her about the oysters. So you find her eating oyster stew. One time she was sick and Willie gave her some oyster stew and it made her sicker. So that's the balance here. And also she always made it clear we should not force vegetarianism on everyone. There's a number of statements where she said that. So for her, vegetarianism was an application of the principle of healthful living. And I think that's how we should approach it today. I'm all for the vegan diets. I'm not a vegan myself, but I respect it a lot. I'm a lacto-ova-vegetarian, probably like many of you. And that's great, but we should not force it on others. Eat what is going to best bring you health, whatever that might be. That's the principle. The application changes. Let's see, I'm going to move on here, go through some of this quickly. Here's another interesting issue regarding the, the principle. Cooking on the Sabbath should be avoided. On Friday, let the preparation for the Sabbath be completed. See that all the cooking is done. Okay, well, in Ellen White's day, simple cooking was itself a very complex, time-consuming operation that required lots of work. Even simple cooking required work. The principles are this, nothing that could be done on the previous six working days should be left to Sabbath hours and all unnecessary work should be avoided. Those are the principles. Some people apply them differently, all right? They're, it's probably applied differently in homes, represented right here. And as long as you're being faithful to the principles, we should not dispute someone else's application if it's different than ours. But you've got, for example, some applications of the principles, self-timing ovens and microwave, microwaves. Cooking is no longer the time-consuming, labor-intensive chore of yesteryear. You can stick the dish in the oven, time it when you leave, and it's going to cook while you're at church. But some still don't want to even do that, and that's fine. There are different applications of the principles. Whatever preparation that can be done on Friday should still be done on Friday. On Friday, let the preparation for the Sabbath be completed. See that all clothing is in readiness and that all the cooking is done. Let the boots be blackened and the baths taken. No baths on Sabbath. But in the 19th century, you had to prepare your own bath. Slowly, laboriously prepare the water. It was work. That's something you should do on Friday. But today, hopping in the shower out of the shower is a quick painless process and some of us need it to keep us awake for church I don't polish my shoe I still don't polish my shoes on the Sabbath I know many others who don't she also made another statement that critics have exploited she told ministers not to shave on the Sabbath and this critic says look there look at all these Adventist ministers who shave on the Sabbath because they want to look good before their people I shaved this part of my face today. But in the 19th century, shaving was a laborious process. You had to prepare your own shaving cream, mix it up, and you had to sharpen that. You didn't have a nice little razor like we have today, the twin blades like I have, you know. You, you had one blade, and you could shave a little bit, and you had to sharpen it. You'd shave a little bit more, and you, it took like 30, 40 minutes to shave. It was work. In that setting, it makes perfect sense for men not to shave on the Sabbath. That should be done outside of the Sabbath. But when it's today, it's different. It makes us, it can, 
It's easy to do. It can be done in a couple of minutes, and it helps us feel fresh and ready for church. Again, each apply it differently, but that's the app. The principle is don't do anything that violates the Sabbath. The applications of that can be different, as you can see, and they are different according to time periods. The fifth rule, stay balanced. Avoid, avoiding extreme interpretations. Adventist history is laced with extreme views of Ellen White. And let me tell you something. Ellen White herself was never extreme. It's many of her followers who have been extreme. In 1894, she pointed out that there is a class of people who are always ready to go off on some tangent, who want to catch up something strange and wonderful and new. But God would have all move calmly, considerately, choosing our words in harmony with the solid truth for this time, which requires to be presented to the mind as free from that which is emotional as possible, while still bearing the intensity and solemnity that it is proper it should bear. We must guard against creating extremes. This is Ellen White writing. Guard against encouraging those who would either be in the fire or in the water. That's quite opposites, isn't it? And I tell you, in my work... I run into some of the most extreme, crazy ideas and forgive me people that I've ever seen in my life. I get some of the strangest stuff in the mail. And it's always so fresh, refreshing to me to come and present to an audience like this. You just are nice people. You're balanced. Your faces tell me that. But believe me, I've been to places far from here. Let's just go on. Nearly four decades earlier, Mrs. White had written that she saw that many have taken advantage of what God has shown in regard to the sins and wrongs of others. They have taken the extreme meaning of what has been shown in vision and then have pressed it until it has had a tendency to weaken the faith of many in what God has shown. People get off on this tangent and they take these statements of Ellen White out of context and they press them and they press them and they press them and they slap people across the face with them. That has done more damage to Ellen White's credibility than probably anything else in the history of Adventism. And many of the former Adventists that are against Adventists and Ellen White now, that was their experience growing up. They had Ellen White slapped across their face. James White made this interesting statement about extremes regarding Ellen White in the Review and Herald. This is in the earlier years. They, They were experiencing this as early as the 1860s. She works to this disadvantage, namely... She makes strong appeals to the people which a few feel deeply and take strong positions and go to extremes. Then to save the cause from ruin in consequence of these extremes, she is obliged to come out with reproofs for extremists in a public manner. This is the better than to have things go to pieces, but the influence of both the extremes and the reproofs are terrible on the cause and brings upon Mrs. White a threefold burden. Now notice this is the part of the cleverness of James White. Here is the difficulty. What she may urge to the tardy is taken by the prompt to urge them over the mark. And what she may say to, the, to caution the prompt, zealous and cautious ones, is taken by the tardy as an excuse to remain far too far behind. So people then were misreading her statements and taking them to extreme. And that has unfortunately happened throughout our history. Part of our task, George Knight wrote, in reading Ellen White is to avoid extreme interpretations and to understand her message in its proper balance. That in turn means we need to read the counsel from both ends of the spectrum on a given topic. Always look for a balancing statement. I was lecturing to my students on this the other day to the senior theology majors in the Ellen White class. Always look for a balancing statement. When she makes a strong statement here, it's always going to be balanced with another statement, a balancing statement. Ellen White is very consistent with that. That's where the CD-ROM will come in handy. So don't take one final strong statement as the final word. Look at the larger framework of what she's talking about, and she will clarify herself. Let's see. I'm going to go on because of time here. Not just because I need to leave. I don't want to hold you so long. Some say that she, she was against any type of playing ball or sports. Well, she, again, she was balanced. I do not condemn the simple exercise of playing ball, but this, even in its simplicity, may be overdone. So notice the balance there. And that's a balancing statement to when she said to, to several students at Battle Creek that they should never play ball. Well, she was talking about ball games that become very 
competitive. But simple ball, when competitive is not a big issue, she was not against that. The sixth rule, remember that inspiration is not verbal dictation. We have an interesting hist- and unfortunate history in our church. Many contemporaries with Ellen White believe that God dictated everything to her word for word. Now, if you study the Bible, it does not teach word for word dictation. I call it whole person inspiration. This is what I describe in my book, Ellen White Under Fire, in the chapter on inspiration. Whole person inspiration. God addressed the whole person in the context of their entire life. But there are many who took this rigid view of Ellen White. Here's an example of one person, and many still do this today. I was led to conclude and most firmly believe that every word that you ever spoke in public or private, that every letter you ever wrote under any and all circumstances was as inspired as the Ten Commandments. And he viewed the Ten Commandments as dictated. So that's what he means. That's a physician who had understood Ellen White's writings this way. way. She wrote him back and responded without hesitation. She said, my brother... You have studied my writings diligently and have never found that I have made any such claims. Neither will you find that the pioneers in our cause ever made such claims. Now, Willie White, her most significant interpreter and son in later years, said this, Mother has never laid claim to verbal inspiration, and I do not find that my father or Elder Bates, Andrew Smith, or Wagner put forth this claim. If there were verbal inspiration in writing her manuscripts, Why would there be on her part the work of addition or adaptation? Remember I showed you this morning how the great controversy grew and expanded as she wrote it, expanded the pages and the depth and nuances of it? It is a fact that Mother often takes one of her manuscripts and goes over it thoughtfully, making additions that develop the thought still further. Now, the problem with verbal inspiration is that it creates rigid, a rigid view of inspiration creates a rigid view of interpretation. Because if you believe in a word-for-word view of interpretation, the tendency is, and I found this repeatedly within the church and without, the tendency is to be legalistic in interpreting her and it's to isolate the context of those statements. I mean, if you believe in word-for-word information, then one or two words... That's fully inspired. It doesn't matter about the context. So the tendency with a rigid view of inspiration is to ignore the larger context. That's the danger of it. That's a problem with it. That's why I put it here in one of the principles or rules of interpreting Ellen White. The seventh and final rule is this. Maintain a healthy spiritual mindset. Be balanced yourself. And that's something some of us have to work at. A.G. Daniels, our most famous and productive general conference in Adventist church history, worked with Ellen White for many years and knew her well. And he provides an excellent first-person testimony about her life and work. He said, Sister White was never a fanatic. She was never an extremist. She was a level-headed woman. She was well-balanced. I found that so during a period of 40 years of association with her. Here are some suggestions for approaching Ellen White in a balanced way, for reading her holistically. First, begin your study with a prayer for guidance and understanding. The Holy Spirit who inspired the work of prophets across the ages is the only one who is in a position to unlock the meaning of their writings. So pray, not only when you open the Bible, but when you open Ellen White's writings. Second, approach your study with an open mind. Most of us realize that no person is free from bias or free of bias. No one is completely open-minded. We all have a pre-understanding, pre-ideas in our minds, presuppositions, to use a more technical term. And we bring that to the table, and the danger is we often read that into the Bible, and we often read that into Ellen White, and we interpret it accordingly and give our own biased interpretation of it when not really listening to what she is saying. We also recognize that bias enters into every area of our lives, but that reality doesn't mean that we need to let our biases control us. Finally, exercise faith and avoid any doubt. Many think it a virtue, Ellen White wrote, a mark of intelligence to them, in them, to be unbelieving and to question and quibble. 
My friend Derek Morris, editor of Ministry Magazine, calls this the culture of unbelief. That's our culture today, a culture of unbelief. God does not propose to remove all occasion for unbelief. He gives evidence which must be carefully investigated with a humble mind and a teachable spirit. And all should decide from the weight of evidence. That's the best way to look at any statement, uh, an extreme interpretation. Look at the weight of evidence. So here they are, the seven rules of interpretation. All of them are important, but two and three, the literary context and historical context, are so important. Bottom line is, folks, it's not easy, but we all got to be good students if we're going to correctly interpret these writings. And when you and I do, a great blessing awaits us. So let's interpret them aright. And let's help others interpret those writings aright. Let's hold each other accountable to correct interpretation. And we'll avoid these extremes. We'll be set on the right path. And we'll be more ready for Jesus to come. That's what these writings are all about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for a gorgeous Sabbath afternoon, the great fellowship we've had thus far this day. Again, we thank you for these writings of Ellen White. And Lord, we're reminded this afternoon that those writings have a context, a historical context, a literary context. And we need to understand that context, that setting. So help us to read these writings aright and hear your voice speaking to our souls through them. So bless each one of these dear people in their walk with you, in their engagement with Ellen White's writings. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.